argue that laws concerning the life and liberty of human beings should read in the poetry of fortune cookies and be backed up with the legal precedent of Yale's speeches. Section 1021b2 was passed with bipartisan support, bought and paid for by lobbyists in one of this nation's most mistrusted congresses and signed into law by Ad Age Marketer of the Year with a signing statement as arbitrary and deceptive as the Justice Department's about face appeal and argument in this very case. Let's dispense with the myth that the ubiquitous application of extrajudicial power is the exception to an unchecked executive. And let's dispense with the myth that Congress has the constitutional power to legislate the military detention of civilians. Yeah. Let's also dispense with the myth that the U.S. government hasn't already detained journalists under the AUMS seeking to gain intelligence on media organizations. <laughs> or the myth that the president hasn't played a personal role in the imprisonment of a journalist covering the U.S. war on terror in Yemen. I've covered the WikiLeaks release of JTF memoranda known as the Guantanamo Files and revolutions across the Middle East and North Africa. I've conducted hours of interviews with former Gitmo prison guards, detainees, defense lawyers, and human rights activists. For the last year, I've covered the U.S. investigation of WikiLeaks, and to date, I've published the only publicly available transcripts for the secret prosecution of Bradley Manning taking place at Fort Meade. Because of my work as a journalist, government contractors attempted to falsely link a group which I helped found, whose only purpose is to support campaign finance reform in the United States to Al-Qaeda. They even published articles of their own, showcasing their ability to make Americans pay a hundred times more for the insecurity we could have had for free, stating the group that I helped found was infiltrated with Al-Qaeda and so-called cyber terrorists. Emails published by WikiLeaks indicated that other security contractors with ties to the U.S. government were specifically asked to connect this group to any Saudi or other fundamentalist Islamic organizations. DHS published their unintelligence, declaring an error that the group that I helped found was linked to cyber terrorists. I am grateful to the individuals, including a fellow journalist who privately warned me that there were other unpublished government documents and that agents had their sight on me. I am grateful to the attorneys, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afrin, to the other plaintiffs, to Tangerine Bolin and to Chris Hedges for their generosity of spirit towards me and their good work. Section 1021 violates the First and Fifth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, our greatest protection against threats to our liberty and national security. This legislative spawn of our national ideology, the war on terror, also preys on the spirits of people because it offers us the illusion of an identity, of dignity, of morality, making it easier for this nation and our people to part with them all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessalyn Radak, and I'm with the Government Accountability Project. I am an amicus in this case because, as a whistleblower, when I blew the whistle, Back in 2001, in the case of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind, our government called me a traitor, a turncoat, and a terrorist sympathizer. Now, 10 years later, I am representing other whistleblowers. But it's gotten even worse because Obama has started an unprecedented war on whistleblowers by prosecuting them under an antiquated World War I law called the Espionage Act, which makes them enemies of the state. Terms like most dangerous man in America for Ellsberg, terms like traitor and turncoat and terrorist sympathizer for me, and terms like enemy of the state for my clients like Tom Drake and John Kiriakou bring us within the ambit of people who are providing substantial support to terrorism because that particular clause is so broad and so vague that we could be removed from
um, the benefits of a regular civilian trial, innocent until proven guilty and have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt into indefinite military detention without charge, counsel, or judicial review. And that is unacceptable. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Woo! With the lowered. I stand here as a free American, but I spent five years under the assault of the U.S. government because I simply spoke truth to power. As an NSA whistleblower, I exposed and disclosed high crimes and misdemeanors that were actually committed by the U.S. government up to and including the White House. Secret surveillance, warrantless wiretapping, massive fraud, waste, and abuse, billions and billions of dollars being wasted of U.S. taxpayer money. What we see here is a Magnificent Seven standing in the breach against the final assault by this administration, which is continuing from the previous administration since 2001, under the excuse that somehow we live in exigent conditions, that it's somehow because these conditions are so different and so extraordinary that the Constitution is just a mere piece of paper and it's not worth what it was written on. I emphatically disagree. It is. It is it is the grand experiment launched over 220 years ago. It gives no government, no person, no agency or military to take away what are our rights, what are our liberties, what are our freedoms. Well, let me just give you a small taste of what it's like to live under the national security state. In 2006, I came under direct investigation by the U.S. government. Why? Because I was disclosing crimes being committed by the U.S. government against its own people in total violation of the Fourth Amendment. All done in secret, and all done in secret because the executive decided, you know what, we don't have to have an open and free democracy. We don't need transparency. We will determine in secret what's best for the American people, and we will keep them safe on our terms. In 2006, I came under investigation, and for the next five years, I faced the distinct possibility that I would spend many, many decades in prison. In fact, in 2008, the chief prosecutor said, Mr. Drake, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison unless you start cooperating with us? In 2010, they prosecuted and then indicted me with 10 felony counts, five under the Espionage Act. Do you know what it means to be charged on the Espionage Act as an American? And all I did was stand up to support and defend the Constitution, a Constitution that I had supported and defended by taking the oath four times in my government career. But no, espionage. I'm placed into the same category of people like Alger Hiss and Alger James. Why? Because I exercise my rights under the Constitution to speak truth to power. And for that, they criminalize me. Yeah. That is what's at stake. If we don't stand here now, if we don't take the stand we need to take for all of us, all rights and all liberties and all freedoms, they will simply take them away. There's a thin line right now, a very thin line, between what's left of the Constitution and the equivalent of martial law in this country, military rule. There's nothing less than that at stake. They know what they're doing. And the Constitution is the only thing that stands in their way. And if it's not us, then who? And if not now, when? It's time to take the stand. We cannot stand that this provision in the NDA remains in force. Otherwise, we will simply see the force of secret military rule and executive fiat law prevail over the Constitution. And that is not, that is not a country I want to live in. Amen! Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Drake. Now
National Security Agency whistleblower, and a free American. I was wondering if you could clarify the position of the Senate Amici that it, their argument in front of the court was that essentially the NDAA with the same writing as the a, uh, yeah. U of F. The, that was their argument? The question is, didn't the senators who argued as Amici say the NDAA and the AUMF are the same? Well, that's what the government said. And the government argued, well, we've had the AUMF for 11 years, and we haven't arrested journalists in the U.S., so what's the big deal? The NDAA is merely the same. Well, it's not, because the N AUMF, the Supreme Court said in the Hamdi case applies to those who support hostile forces and who are engaged in armed conflict with the U.S. The NDAA drops off that second part of the Supreme Court's test. It allows people to be incarcerated only if they, if they substantially support these groups. It does not require that they be combatants. And that is the difference. The senators are wrong. We're quite sure, Carl Mayer can, can jump in on that too, we're quite sure the court is sensitive to that fact. The government had no cases to show an, a similar, an identity between these two laws. Well, let's just bear in mind that the two senators who were uh, desperate to argue today were Senators Graham and McCain. So never forget what, who the sponsors were of this legislation. Lindsey Graham, in sponsoring this legislation, said quite clearly, if you're a member of Al-Qaeda and you want a lawyer, we're going to tell you, shut up, you're not entitled to a lawyer. Therefore, stating essentially that Lindsey Graham is deciding who's a terrorist, who's not a terrorist, and trying to take away the, the laws, the, the legal protections of the citizens of the United States. So uh, Lindsey Graham has been very clear about this. He called uh, Guantanamo detainees, for example, he called them a crazy bastard, even ones who've never, who haven't been um, uh, uh, tried or, uh, or, or charged. Uh, so this demonization of people and this assumption that uh, somehow these uh, extreme right-wing senators can dictate judicial policy in this country or judicial outcome is what we're fighting for. You know, I want to add a note, an anecdote. Uh, during the budget debate, you know, McCain and Graham kept coming up in all the coverage. And I said to Carl, why is it that these two guys are the only ones you ever hear quoted in the Senate. And Carl said, well, they're actually the only ones who do any work. But <laughs> they happen to be wrong on this case. You know, their actions in the Senate subvert the rights of Americans. And whatever merits they might have in their lives, Senator McCain certainly has, has an honored history. They're wrong in how they see the Constitution. Yes, sir. No, the, the question was, is it unusual that the senators will do this? Who should we? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we put in papers <coughs> opposing their ability to, to present the argument. Uh, it is unusual. It's been denied other times because there are many members of the Senate. There's all sorts of questions about what the, the Senate uh, uh, stood for. They only stand for one position. And in fact, the, the, the Senate voted to repeal this provision that we're fighting. And then it was stripped out of the conference committee by uh, Graham and McCain. So they've been uh, driving a lot of this debate. But you know, frankly, I don't, I don't think that they added that much. And I don't think the, ju the judges thought that they added that much. Um, but you know, the, 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 government, the government was good for some, some comedy, though, I must say. In their, in their, in their papers, they, they say that, that we ought to be, the journalists are protected under the uh, first protocol of the Geneva Convention. Funny thing is, the United States never ratified the first <laughs> protocol. So I don't feel very protected, and I don't think our clients do either. I hope this court sees through this. By the way, when the senators got to argue, they added five minutes to the government side. We got more time, so it didn't really bother us. <laughs> to follow up on your question about the uh, uh, the original Feinstein uh, bill, Feinstein Lee, that 
it, it passed the Senate uh, in conference. It went to um, a provision that stated essentially that uh, habeas corpus would not, it, nothing in the bill would be construed as habeas corpus or your constitutional rights being denied. How does that affect this provision, the 1021B provision? Well, the, 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 the conference amendment. Right. Well, the, 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 um, what, what was eventually added was a provision that allows for habeas corpus. And the, the, the answer is, uh, is exactly what Judge Forrest held in her opinion. Habeas corpus is just a proceeding. Once someone's already detained, they can then move the government to, to, to clear them. Usually these cases take seven or eight years, so it's really it's, you're still violating the constitutional rights of folks by uh, detaining them in the first place. So the conference committee, the, the language that was added doesn't solve the problem at all. Can I just get a, a synopsis of what the outcome of the case today, the hearing today was? Well, we, we argued the case both sides. It was, I think, you know, comprehensively argued. The court was mostly concerned with the question of, does Section E that says all existing law still remains in effect, even for a person detained in the U.S., does that mean that there's no real problem because if the law says you have to be released, there's really no harm, no foul? And we answered the court, well, that section of the law actually says that Americans in this country can be detained, but they can assert their rights to get out later. But we don't have presumption of detention in this country for speech-related activities. And I think we made the point quite clear to the court that this presumes something that the Supreme Court has always said is unconstitutional, the detention of Americans by the military, who's civilians by the military. Uh, you know, and so I think that was where it comes down to. The court was very concerned with whether this is a saving of the statute. And I think we pointed out very bluntly to the court, it defines the evil of the statute by saying, if you are detained in this country, whatever rights you have still apply. And we made it clear to the court, this presumes an illegal detention. That's probably where the case comes out in the end. Does that provision eliminate harm, or is it simply a part of the harm? In the last hearing, um, Catherine Forrest nearly held the government lawyer in contempt because he didn't know under which statute they were either holding people or not. I mean, so doesn't that kind of clearly show, like, the blurring of the lines on, on the part of the government? Well, you know, the, the government said in the case to the judge, Judge Forrest, we don't really know whether we're using the law because we don't keep track of what statutes we detain people under. So the judge said, well, you people may be in contempt. She didn't hold them in contempt, but she said, if you don't know what statutes you're using and you're violating my preliminary <laughs> order, you might be in contempt. Maybe Carl wants to address the contempt also. Right. No, well, the, I think Judge Forrest was just, was just very forceful on that, that point that uh, the government was playing uh, fast and loose with the facts. They refused to uh, keep track of how they were detaining people, even though her injunction seemed to suggest that's exactly what they had to do. And the government kept shifting its positions. And throughout this uh, lawsuit, the government keeps shifting its positions. They, they initially said at trial that they, they couldn't guarantee that any of the plaintiffs wouldn't be subject to detention. They said that's flat out. And then they lost. They changed their position a little bit. They lost. They changed their position a little bit. And now, now they're claiming, oh, you guys don't have to worry. Well, you know what? We'd like a federal court to tell us. So we're, we're going to have to close up in a minute here. We have, um, I have one more person I'd like to come up because he really well, he symbolizes uh, the, why we should be afraid. Um, Jacob Applebaum is here with us today and uh, got a few comments and then I, I've got a few things to tell you before you leave. Hi. So I, I wasn't expecting to say anything today. I just came out like the rest of the people that are here to support them in their case. I just came out today to support them in their case today like the rest of the Americans and other people who are here. And I, I guess the reason that you wish me to speak is because I have actually been detained by the U.S. government a number of times where they denied me access to a lawyer, where they told me that I would maybe never even get a trial, where they actually threaten. When they talk about these things in a sort of abstract sense here in this court and they say it's only for enemies, well, they've actually called me a terrorist. I've had members of the U.S. Army detain me on U.S. soil. And actually, and I know that I'm not the only one. And, I, and if I had been a Muslim American in the last 10 years, I probably would have had it a lot worse for the last 10 years. But the point is that it's not an abstract thing. And what these people are fighting here today is one of the most important court cases 
that is happening in America right now. And what here, here. we see across the country is stuff that is even worse in some cases. Drone strikes, um, what happened to Anwar al-Waki and his 16-year-old son in Yemen? This is an expansion of authoritarianism across the entire spectrum. Whether it's the case that Birgitta Yonsad, Rup Gongrip and I have recently lost in the Fourth Circuit about the government needing to get warrants to get data, whatever it is, across the board you see this expansion of authoritarianism. And these people, their court case is so important. So you should tell your family members and your friends really to support them in any way that you possibly can, but also to understand that this will affect everyone if it is as bad as it seems to be. And I think it is that bad, if not worse. <laughs> and just imagine sure, what sure. happens when we have this, and it is absolutely unambiguous. Combined with the drone strikes, combined with the warrantless wiretapping, the lack of actual due process, where they pretend that due process is any process they make up instead of judicial process. Yeah. This is really scary shit. This is really, really <laughs> scary. And as someone who has been detained by some of these people, let me tell you, it does not get less scary. So please support them. Thank you for coming today. That's actually a perfect segue to my final comment. Uh, we wouldn't be here today if we hadn't created something kind of unique and uh, unorthodox. And it's really important uh, to uh, communicate that to you guys. I had hoped to uh, do something different in that I combined a lawsuit with a campaign. And this campaign is worldwide. We have people all over the world, tens of thousands, perhaps more, who support us. We've been working together in, the, in these conflicting imperatives. I mean, I've had to learn a lot about the law in the last year, and it's been a little messy. I'm exhausted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, together, we, we've raised money to cover the cost of this case. We have live streamers here that we've, we've met along the way. People have helped us on every front. And, you know, when we're facing so many compromised, broken, toxic systems, when our voices are not being heard, and there's no chance for our voices to be heard because the only voices that, that are being heard are moneyed voices, corporate voices. We, we have lost our representative democracy. It no longer exists. Together, we have to get it back, and we have to be creative about that. We have to be nimble and flexible and fast on our feet, but we really have to work together. And the last thing I want to say about that is I feel really honored to be part of this evolving tribe, and I want to actually say a tri or pay tribute to Aaron Swartz, whom we lost yes. a few weeks ago, as you all know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Aaron Swartz linked me to Demand Progress. David Siegel is here today. Demand Progress is our partner in the case and has carried us from day one. We wouldn't be here without Aaron Swartz. So we're all part of this evolving tribe, Jacob Applebaum, WikiLeaks, Birgitta, people all over the world who are paying witness to what the United States government has done and become since 9-11. We have to keep being witness to that, and we have to come together and make sure we stop these people. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Chris Hitchens, yeah. who uh, uh, really got the thing started, I believe, and, really and to the lawyers and the Tangerine. And I have to say, I get invited to ask to add my name to things like this uh, quite a bit. I go by the people who signed it, and whether it's a good cause in general. I would have had to say the chance of getting where we are now, arguing this is going to be important, having won an injunction, uh, I would have said was not a, a zero. No chance. It's a symbolic thing. So we're here today after more than a decade of what I said earlier was an assault on the Constitution. Uh, we had something very like a coup in September 11th, September 12th, uh, beginnings of which we started in the early years. I believe the people who run this country then, and I have to say now, uh, pretty much agree with Richard Nixon. When the president does it, it's not illegal. Meaning that, that they work for one man who is elected, who is above the law, and who can do literally anything he wants. Now, we've been seeing that year after year after year. And what is different, what is different, makes this day different from all other days, if I may say, uh, is that, in fact, a judge stood up. A district judge stood up and read the Constitution, uh, showing it still has life in it. And, you know, remember, this isn't something that uh, 
is just uh, a very technical, esoteric point here between prosecutors and lawyers. Uh, the fact is that to read that part of the law as anything but unconstitutional from the point of view of the U.S. of A. is, I'd say, virtually disqualified you as uh, for an American bar. So we're facing here at last <laughs> what's not new is a direct, explicit challenge to our freedom. And what is new, and that's what's to celebrate, is that uh, one judge and, and the other people, like Tangerine and the judges and the others who have supported this, have actually taken a stand uh, for preserving the Constitution, and we've got to go on from there. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> 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 Christopher Hitchens. No. <laughs> I just want to make one last point, and that is that when Judge Catherine Forrest issued her ruling, the Obama administration didn't just appeal. They demanded an emergency stay, which means they wanted the judge to put this law back into effect immediately until the Second Circuit would hear the appeal. Judge Forrest, to her credit, refused. And so the Obama administration went to the Second Circuit and demanded an emergency stay, which the Second Circuit gave them. Now, the supposition can only be made. We knew they'd appeal, of course, but we didn't expect them to respond this aggressively. And the supposition is that they responded this aggressively because they were already using the law. If they are holding American citizens in detention and denying them due process, as I suspect they are, probably with uh, U.S. Pakistani dual nationals in places like Bagram, uh, and that injunction was allowed to stand, they would be in contempt of court. And so the response of the Obama administration, the accelerated appeal, the fact that it's very clear to us, to the lawyers, that uh, if the appellate court upholds Judge Forrest's ruling, this will be expedited uh, probably within weeks to the Supreme Court, shows to us that this law, as far as we can make out, is probably already in effect. Thank you. We do have a panel discussion this evening at the Culture Project on 45 Bleecker Street. Filmmaker Michael Moore is joining us. Um, there are a bunch of us there who's here who are going to be on that panel. I'd get there early, though. It's a very small venue. If you want to go as a journalist, talk to Andy Stepanian. <laughs> Right here. Um, so just a quick announcement for both the journalists and also subjects of interviews coming up throughout the afternoon. Um, if you're a journalist that would like to try to attempt to get a one-on-one -on -one interview with one of the plaintiffs before the panel, we're opening the doors at the venue at 3.30 p.m. We have a window of time from 3.30 p.m. to 4.45 p.m. to try and nail down interviews with the plaintiffs as well as Michael Moore. Michael Moore will be arriving at 4.30 p.m. to schedule you have a you have a card for your I'll be there tonight. Oh, you going tonight? Okay, good. Where's your show at? It's an online show with the young kids. You're one of the plaintiffs that's going to the law office. Uh, Tangerine and Lucas will take you there now. And so this press conference has concluded. I may go to the, the event later on today, the uh, events warrant. Now that I have the attention of 200 some odd people, uh, I would like to ask you to follow me on Twitter at the Pella Report, T-H-E-P-E-L-L-A, Report. Also, if you feel like adding me on Facebook, if you are entertained, if you are entertained by outlandish opinions, Please do add me. My name is Michael Pel Philip Pelagotti, and uh, if you wish to donate to my WePay, you can. Uh, whether it's a dollar, whether it's a million, doesn't matter. Every little bit helps. Uh, this is how I go around to uh, present uh, streams like this to your uh, viewing eyes. I would like to thank you all so much for watching today's edition of the Pell Report. Um, you, if you follow me on Twitter, I will give you an announcement regarding uh, about uh, what I'm doing later today. 
I may uh, try to get into this uh, panel discussion. Not, oh, you'll be notified. So, uh, thank you all for watching. This is Michael Pelagati, uh, and I'm signing off. So, you have yourselves a good day, and maybe I'll see you later. Take care, folks.